Hello and welcome back to QED and QCD. In fact, today will be the first day really of QCD because we will construct the QCD Lagrangian and that of course will allow us to calculate the scattering cross-section for QCD processes. Now when the QCD Lagrangian was constructed first, it was already known that the uh, fermions of the theory, the quarks, would carry fractional charge because three of them was needed to make up the proton. Now it was also known that a new quantum number had to be, uh, or they had to carry a new quantum number because the omega minus was made up of three otherwise identical strange quarks and of course as fermions three uh, identical uh, strange quarks couldn't be in the same state, couldn't be allowed in the same quantum state. So therefore a new quantum number with three degrees of freedom was needed. Now why three? Well that was seen this right here, the QCD Lagrangian. Why was the new not flavor because one already had up, down, strange, but why was the new color of the quarks? Why was three needed? Well, we already saw that if one calculated sigma e plus e minus two hadrons over sigma mu plus mu minus, sorry, e plus e minus to, to muons, Then one got three, so that's the number of colors, times the sum over the square of the charges, over the fermions or the flavors that are allowed at the given center of mass energy. So one could directly measure how many different colors these quarks come in. So one would start naturally with a free Lagrangian for the fermion field, psi bar, so it's a d slash minus m, slide over d slash minus m, is equal to zero. And the Lagrangian then would be contain this term. But of course, This is for one fermion, and I'm saying that really the quark field is three different fermions that behave much the same, but they carry three different charges, right? So that means that instead of using just a single fermion field, we should use three fermion fields. So what we have here So this is what one would have in a normal Lagrangian. Let us write what the QCD one would then be. Not see if it's LQCD, right? So what we would have was psi bar, and then let's not now write I, where I runs from one to three. And then instead of P slash, we write I, and then there would be a D slash minus M. Sine j. So that will be our free Lagrangian or for the free fermion field when we've now written here, let's write on j, the rules for a freely propagating colored fermion field. So our psi i is where it has i in color space, taking on the values 1, 2, 3. Now, so psi i is a, a three column vector and it's operated on, let's say, by three by three matrices. Because what we'll do is to say, actually, this QCD Lagrangian, in order to connect it with gluons, let's try and see what happens 
if we require local gauge invariance of this, these colored uh, fermions. Much as gauge invariance was seen to hold for the uh, QED Lagrangian, we will now say actually we want it to hold for the QCD Lagrangian. We want these uh, predictions that would come from the uh, QCD Lagrangian to be gauge invariant under changes between the three colors of the fermion field. So we say here that we require gauge invariance under local gauge transformations which sends our psi i right the i is understood now that it's a three uh, vector in uh, color space psi i goes into um, psi is called prime equals e to the minus i theta a it can depend on x and of course if we need to transform a three vector then we need three by three matrices so if we write it out in infinitesimal transformation it would send psi into one minus i theta a t a psi now it turns out that one needs eight such matrices to allow for all colorful transformations of the psi so we need eight different matrices and therefore eight different color fields so if we want to or if we require the Lagrangian to be invariant or gauge invariant on such transformations then just as for QED we will need a gluon field another vector field that can make our d mu term invariant so we'll have a a mu field which is as I said we need eight of those for all to control all the eight different matrices in SU3 and then we'll require a derivative a covariant derivative which makes our Lagrangian term there gauge invariant so the correct derivative will be d mu delta ij which does not change the color of the fermion field and then plus i a new coupling gs t a i j a a mu now a here run from 1 to 8 ij run from 1 to 3 Now, these new color fields or, or gluons, in QED, we had a symbol Lagrangian term that was minus F mu nu, F mu nu. For these non abelian fields, non abelian because the matrices do not commute, we can have the Lagrangian term similar minus F mu nu, F mu nu. If we put f a mu nu equal to d mu a nu for the field a minus d nu a mu plus g s f a d c a a a c where these f a b c so-called structure constants 
of the gauge group. So FABC are defined by the commutator between the matrices that live in the uh, representation of the fermions that act, the three by three matrices that act on the colored fermion field. You say TA to the commutator is I, F, A, B, C, T, C. Right, so. So, if you remember, if you chew off spin, you would have um, the commutator of uh, two power matrices be equal to I, Epsilon, I, J, K, J, K, right? So, for issue two, you have um, J, I, J, and J is equal to I, Epsilon, I, J, K, J, K. For issue three, we just call them, we don't have them I, J, K, but they are F, A, B, C. Now, the uh, TA that generate the color symmetry group, SU3, we can choose a explicit, re a explicit representation of those, just as well as the power matrices are explicit representations of uh, the SU2 uh, gauge group. So for SU3, the gauge group operating on the three color charges of the uh, fermion field of the quark fields. We say we choose an explicit uh, representation, which is a half lambda a, where lambda a are the gel man matrices, which I'll write down here below. So we have a uh, Lambda 1 is equal to 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? So what does this mean? Well, it means that uh, Lambda operates in color space, so imagine that Psi has three fields, we can call them red, green, blue, and then Lambda on psi would turn a field which is green, is that correct, into something that is red. Let's try. <laughs> zero, one, zero, one, zero, 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 zero. So if a field starts off red, then that becomes a zero, 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 zero. So when lambda 1 acts on a red field, it becomes green. So that's the, how the Gelman matrices work. So we can have another lambda 2. 0, 1, 5, 0, 5, 0, 0. And lambda 3. Turns out that one needs, as I said, eight such to parameterize all allowed changes of color.
that in practice, one doesn't calculate one particular uh, change of color, right? We're not interested necessarily in the in a process that changes the uh, red quark into a green quark, for example. Of course, they're not <laughs> red, green, and blue, and uh, colored objects aren't observed. It's always colorless hadrons that we see, so one is always uh, interested in summing over all colors and averaging. Now, well, that means that we always I just need to uh, calculate the traces over specific or over the color matrices. One can indeed calculate with specific color flows, and that's very efficient. But uh, when we want to calculate specific uh, processes, one will often have to calculate traces over all possibilities. Again, one could calculate them explicitly by choosing as an explicit uh, representation of the color algebra or one can do it uh, uh, analytically by calculating traces over the color matrices. Now here we see that the trace over all GA, for example, for any choice of A is always zero. The trace over two is in this representation a half delta AB and the sum over all different colors of the gluons, or all types of the gluons, G, A, uh, I, J, T, A, J, K, S, C, F, or C, F is a number that I'll declare later, delta I, K, and the sum over gluons A and B of F, A, B, C, F, a, B, D is equal to a C, A, a number that I'll declare later, delta C, D, only when C and D is equal. And C, F here is equal to four thirds, and C, A is equal to N is equal to three. Now, again, I'll just say that, notice that the uh, A index, B, D, etc., run from 1 to 8 is the gluon index, and I, J, K, etc., 1, 2, 3 is the quark color index. Now, of course, that means that if we have a delta AA, then that's equal to NC squared minus 1 is equal to 8, summed over A, and delta II is NC is equal to 3, the number of quarks. Number gluons, number, sorry, yeah, let's call it number of color charges. For quarks. Now, when we then have the uh, Lagrangian defined as minus in this way f mu nu f mu nu so they carry a sum over a as well and then the uh, quark contribution is the psi bar of color i i d slash where d slash is our new covariant derivative minus m delta i j psi j. So I'll just take it a little bit to explain here. So our psi bar and psi here, right? They are now three row and three column vector in color space, and each component in that three vector is a fermion with four spinner indices, right? Good. Now, this Lagrangian here is invariant under the gauge transformation we sold. 
So, for example, if psi i of x, our spinner, is transformed into j minus i g s theta uh, a t a j sine of x and our gluon field a is transformed into a mu of x plus d e theta b of x where DAB is the current derivative in the joint representation, so acting on the uh, on the gluon field, then we do indeed get a gauge invariant construction. And here DAB mu is D mu delta AB plus I G S A C T C A B where TC are the 8 by 8 matrices that act on the gluons, right? And TCAB, they're defined as IFACB, which is because these are anti-symmetric, minus IFABC. So, funnily enough, these matrices defined this way satisfy the same commutation relation as the uh, fundamental SU3 matrices, so GA, those that act on the quark fields, GAB is still equal to I, F, A, B, C, T, C. So it's the same SU3 algebra that TC fulfills, but the little ta, tb, they act on the uh, quark fields and the big ta, tb act on the gluon fields and therefore the ta are 8 by 8 matrices and the little ta is a 3 by 3 matrix. Now there are some famous relations between the, uh, the structure constants of SU3 have to fulfill this one that's called the Jacobi identity which says that f a, B, C, F, C, D, E, plus F, B, D, C, F, C, A, E, plus F, D, A, C, F, C, D, E, is equal to zero. And this can simplify, or this is important for obtaining the gauge invariance, etc. We won't have to do it uh, to use that here. That's when one gets to cal calculate complicated uh, Feynman diagrams. Now, lastly, of course, just as in QED, one will have to fix a gauge, um, add a gauge fixing term to the Lagrangian. It's called gauge fixing, and we can do that similarly. It's not quite the same, and we'll see some complications later on. Like so, let's just say we add that. Now, what Feynman rules do we get? So, of course, the uh, quark propagator is similar, or it's identical to the propagator that we have for an electron. So, if we have a Propagator for quark of color i, now there's a color index here, and color k, and the momentum p that flows along, then a free, freely propagating quark doesn't change color. Oops, we had a j. So therefore, this will be delta kj. k and j have to be the same. It's an i p slash plus m and there's a p squared minus m squared and let's use the i epsilon prescription. Now a propagating gluon field, if it's freely non-interacting like so, then 
the final rule for that is that a b mu nu and momentum going in this direction is that we have delta a b it also doesn't change color with no interactions and then we have minus i g mu nu over p squared plus i epsilon now this is used in the Feynman gauge where psi equal 1. Now, of course, the covariant derivative of the fermion field will give a similar interaction as in uh, so this derivative here will give an interaction between the gluon field and the quarks. So what will that look like? That will look very much like the interaction between a photon and, a, and an electron. So indeed, there's a final rule for an incoming uh, uh, quark with uh, color charge uh, J, outgoing color charge K, and a gluon say the A with uh, Lorentz index mu. So this vertex here will be a minus I GS gamma mu. So far, very similar to a uh, photon interaction, but what's new is that it will have the color matrix TA KJ. So A here, is the gluon charge or gluon type and k and j are quark color charges so that simply says that a red quark is changed into a green quark with the uh, a red anti-green gluon one can draw color lines for example and say that the red charge goes here Green charge goes there. So that's the final rule for quark quark gluon vertex. Now, what's new in QCD compared to QED is that our term if we knew if we knew doesn't just have the freely propagating photon photon field, but because if we knew now contains the derivative here with an extra a in here, we generate um, three and four gluon vertices. So there will be terms in the Lagrangian with three and four gluon fields in it. So new final rules compared to uh, QED is a three gluon vertex the gluon charges A, B, C, we've got a P mu, we've got a Q mu, we've got an R rho. So this, the rules for this uh, vertex is a G, S, so that's a G, S, F, A, B, C, G mu, nu, Q mu minus Q, Rho plus G mu rho Q minus R mu plus G rho mu R minus P mu. And finally, there's a four gluon vertex. Let's just stop a bit here. So there's a four gluon vertex. Where does the four gluon vertex come from? Well, the four gluon vertex comes from the bits in the D that has IGS AC. And in order to get four powers of A, we need to use that term 
twice. So one from each F mu nu, we have to use that term acting or hitting the, uh, the same term in the other F, right? That's the only way you get uh, four powers of A. Now, in this term here, there's no derivative. That means that there's no momentum dependence. And that is, of course, reflected in the final rule. So the final rule here will be minus i g s squared, right? Because, as I said, in order to get four powers of alpha, we need that term twice, and every time it comes with a g s. So the four gluon vertex will be a g s squared term, and there can be no momentum dependence, so all that's left then is color dependence. So that's through f a b e. Sorry, let me just put all the indices in A, B, C, D. So there's an F, A, B, E, F, C, D, E. So this will be mu, mu, no, sigma. Sigma minus G mu sigma G mu rho plus F A D E F B C E G mu mu G rho sigma minus G Rho G mu sigma. Good. Now, I already said, I'll just repeat here that the uh, color matrices and the spin on matrices, gamma mu, of course, act in different spaces, right? So, G A K J. The kj's act on the uh, uh, color vectors and the uh, gamma matrix in spinner space acts on each of the spinner fields in that three column vector of, uh, of uh, three color uh, vector. Good. So the three gluon vertex and the four gluon vertex are new components compared to QED, we see here that the gluons are self-interacting. Photons don't interact with themselves, at least not unless there's a, at least not a lowest order, uh, in the sense that they need a fermion field to, uh, to couple to, they don't couple directly to each other. But the gluons do couple directly to each other, both through three and four gluon uh, vertices. And that's all due to the non-abelian structure of the gauge group that we require the uh, Lagrangian to be invariant under. So let us quickly investigate how the gluon self-interactions and the non-abelian nature of QCD complicates the gauge discussion. We'll investigate the effect in uh, quark annihilation to two gluon production. So we have a discussion here on gauge invariance. In QCD. And we're looking at the sample calculation of a quark of momentum P annihilating with an anti-quark of momentum prime going into a gluon of momentum k and the gluon of momentum k prime. 
So the altitude here, or sorry, of course we should start by drawing all the Feynman diagrams first. So we have a quark line, we have initial state on the left, final state on the right, then for the k, um, say that mu and k prime of nu, momentum p, p prime, like so. So let's call this diagram A. Then we have a diagram B, just as in QED. But the gluons, in this case, connect differently. But in QCD, there's a third diagram at this lowest order in the perturbative expansion. And that's the one where the quark anionic quark annihilates and then later split up again with the three gluon vertex K, K prime, P, P prime. So, of course, here, let's say that this is also the gluon. Let's say that that has color B and this gluon has color A. So, A, B, A, B. Now, if we take the amplitude of diagram A plus B and call that something. The amplitude A plus B. Now if we leave the gluon polarization vectors out, then we have here epsilon star nu of k, epsilon star nu k prime. And the amplitude For A plus B, is so we've got a minus on a GS squared. Then we start from the pointy end of the uh, sharp end of the Fermi line uh, with a B prime of the prime, and then diagram A will give us a gamma nu. Of course, we will also have a TB for this vertex, the new three by three matrices that we've introduced. Then we'll have the uh, fermion propagator here. That's a P slash minus K over P minus K squared. Let's forget the i epsilon prescription because we're just working at tree level where that has no effect. Gamma nu, and then here we have also a TA. Now, diagram B would again give us a V bar P prime, then there would be a first bit here would be a gamma nu. Then there would be a TA. Then there would be a propagator, which in this case is P prime minus K prime. And then there will be a gamma nu and a TB. And then finally, U of P. Now, that's just as in QED, except now we have the TBs in there. They would not be in there in QED. And let's see what effect that has. So remember that in QED, we would try and, if we were to check for gauge invariance, we would contract A mu with K mu because 
if we were to send these polarization vectors epsilon mu into epsilon mu plus lambda k mu, then we would expect the invariant or the amplitude to be invariant, and that means that k mu contracted with a mu should be zero. So QED water identity would say that um, in QED a mu nu k mu is equal to zero. But if we investigate what we get here in QCD, we see that when we contract with k mu, then in the first piece, first thing we see actually is that since the spinners u and v bar are external spinners then they will be on shell so p slash on u let's say that we work with massless spinners here otherwise of course it should be p slash minus m but p slash on m is equal to zero and also we see that since V bar is on shell, is an on shell spinner, V bar P prime and then P prime slash is equal to zero. Now this means that of course um, when we contract with K mu, this A mu, we get a K slash here. But that K slash hits our U of P. Now, if we subtract p slash from this k slash, then obviously that makes no difference because p slash on u is zero. So we just subtracted zero. But k minus p is minus p slash minus k slash. And that's exactly what we have in the numerator. And we remember that for any vector, v slash v slash is equal to v squared. So if we subtract zero, then we get a term that is nothing but the denominator. So by subtracting zero, we can cancel this fraction. Clever. So this one goes away, and the first piece of the bracket just becomes just gamma nu TB um, TA. Okay, now let's see what we can do with the, oh, and what do we have? We had an extra minus, right? So let's see what we can get with the uh, second piece of this term. We first note that P minus k prime slash or not, let's forget the slashes, p minus k is equal to, let's see if I can get this right, k minus p prime, right? And that's because the momentum conservation tells you that p plus p prime is equal to k plus k prime. Good. So in our Second piece here, we can write every time we see a p minus k prime, we can write that as well, as I just said there, k minus p prime. We can also do that with slashes. Good. So what we had, as I said, is that our V prime 
uh, when p slash p prime slash is hitting our v prime slash from the left, then we get zero. So uh, we can subtract. Sorry, I should have just done that. We can subtract a, a p prime from our piece here and get zero. Right. So this bit here is k minus p prime. So when we contract with our k here, we get a k slash. But instead, I'm going to subtract a zero and say that's really, I can write k slash minus p prime slash as well, because this p prime slash hits our v prime here and produces zero. But then I've got a k minus p prime slash and a, as I wrote here, k minus p prime slash, which is exactly k minus p prime slash squared. So again, I can subtract zero and cancel the fraction, get unity. And then the uh, um, second term just gives me a TA, TB, gamma nu. Remembering that the color matrices and the uh, the uh, matrices here act in different vector spaces. So the t's and the gammas commute. So this whole bracket here, or the whole amplitude rather, gives us the amplitude for a diagram AB mu nu is equal to minus i g s squared v prime of p prime, and then what we have in here is our gamma nu T A T B oops and then there was a, then there was a uh, gamma nu again right here the first term and then minus T B T A and then there's a U of P Ooh. so what we get is minus I G S squared B prime P prime, gamma nu, and then the commutator T A T B U of P, or written because the color matrices and the spinner matrices commute. So there's minus I G S squared T A T B B prime. So V bar P prime, gamma nu, U of P. After contraction with K nu. Good. But this is non-zero, right? It's non-zero because T and T B do not commute. So in QED, those two diagrams will give a gate invariant quantity. They do not in QCD. In fact, if one calculates this diagram here, then one sees that it acts exactly a, a contribution that cancels uh, the gauge dependence of the uh, diagrams A plus B. So it will cancel this contribution, but it actually still has a, uh, it, it still would not give zero. It will give a contribution that only gives zero once it's contracted. So adding diagram C would still only give zero for the uh, contraction with k nu once um, it's contracted with epsilon prime star nu of k prime. 
So once we're taking into account only the physical polarizations of the gluon. So gauge invariance in QCD is a lot more complicated than in QED, but it is still possible to perform the calculations and get uh, correct answers. The uh, trouble here is that one needs to be more clever about the uh, change of the polarization or, or the sum over polarization and the gauge invariance and ensuring that one sums only over propagating degrees of freedom and not longitudinal uh, gluons. We'll talk about that uh, in the next lecture.